Hello, my name is Farhad Bahram, and uh, I want to thank you first for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, my research and specifically this project uh, that I'm working on right now. It is still in progress and uh, you actually see part of it um, there uh, in the exhibition of space called Made in Iran. Um, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there in person. It is actually very ironic because most of my recent projects and my research is about um, issues related to immigration and specifically travel ban in the United States and how it affects individual immigrants, especially Iranian individuals who are living in the States. And it is ironic because I couldn't actually be there uh, because of the same issue. I couldn't be there to talk about my research regarding immigration because I'm an immigrant and I cannot leave the country right now because of my immigration case. Uh, so uh, I appreciate that you give me this opportunity to send you this recorded video about my project. Since I don't have much time, uh, I'm going to jump into uh, the discussion about my research practice and how um, uh, I started my practice in a way that actually uh, led me toward this project that you can see part of it uh, um, through this exhibition. So the, the, the main subject of my research is, uh, uh, as you can see here, is called impotent medium. And uh, what I'm working on is uh, basically the medium of communication, a particular medium of communication um, uh, that cannot be conceived or uh, received through conventional form. Uh, because it constantly negates itself uh, throughout the process of reception. Uh, for that reason, I call it in the, the impotent medium. In order to uh, clarify that, clarify this concept, I would like to talk about myself first. Uh, the image that you can see here in this slide, this photograph, is actually me uh, when I was two years old. And uh, um, this photograph, uh, you can also see my parents, my father at the bottom corner uh, and my uh, mother at the top right corner. Uh, they were both present in this photograph. But uh, since I was a child, uh, I always had this kind of like weird feeling about the presence of my parents, both my uh, father and my mother in my life. And even right now, when I think about my childhood memories, about their appearance in my life and also um, the way in which I experienced my interaction with them throughout my childhood uh, is somehow related to this topic that I'm working on right now. My mother had a very quintessential presence. She had a very soft presence in my life. Um, she was kind of like invisible, like very quiet um, in the space everywhere that I was going as a child. Uh, she was always looking after me, but her presence was so soft and light that I couldn't physically see her around, but I could always feel that she is uh, somewhere very close if I uh, needed her. Uh, she had this kind of like uh, character that I would call invisible presence. She had an invisible presence uh, in my life. My father, on the other hand, he uh, had kind of like the opposite quality. He was very bold, his presence, and uh, uh, sometimes very overwhelming. He was like this object of panopticon that looks at you everywhere uh, and like you felt that like there is nothing that you could do that falls out of his uh, uh, surveillance. And he was in charge of controlling all different aspects of our life. Uh, but we had kind of like the minimum interaction. The interaction that I had with my father was not as uh, quintessential and pervasive as the interaction that I had with my mother. Minimum interaction, but very bold and empowering. So he had this kind of like character that I would rather to call visible absence. So this kind of like dichotomy of presence of my parents in my life was extended into my practice later on when I started my uh, professional practice as a photojournalist, I started to discover the same quality in the images that I uh, was capturing uh, through my camera. So these are these images that I'm showing you are uh, some of the uh, photographs that I captured uh, uh, throughout a two two and a half years project uh, uh, by uh, 
traveling around Iran and visiting uh, indigenous people, indigenous cultures around Iran, especially those cities that are closer to the border uh, of Iran, western border and uh, northwestern border of, uh, of Iran. And um, with the help of another photographer and a writer, we were gathering the stories of people's life um, and uh, preparing material to, uh, to be published in a newspaper um, in Tehran called Hamshari newspaper. So these are some of those photos that were published. And when I, when I was uh, capturing these photos, obviously, because we were telling the story of these people, we had to get close to them and we had to get very intimate with them in order to actually uh, convince them to open up and share the story of their life. So uh, for, uh, with each of these persons, we uh, had to spend at least like few days, three, four days to just follow them, talk to them uh, so they could walk us through their daily life. Uh, and throughout that process, we were getting very close with uh, most of them and they were sharing the story of their lives with us. So there, there was kind of like some sort of intimacy uh, happening between us. And um, after publishing these photos, sometimes like after, for example, two or three years, when I was going back to these images and looking at them, uh, I was feeling the absence of that intimacy in them. Uh, I had this uh, feeling that I couldn't successfully project uh, uh, that intimacy that we were experiencing there as the producer of these images and these stories uh, on personal level uh, through our wordings and the text story, text-based story, and also even the images uh, that we were capturing. So this dichotomy that I was talking about regarding my parents was still present there in those photographs. I could actually somehow find a connection between them, like the images uh, that are uh, or the photographs that are capturing uh, the human essence of these individuals or are supposed to capture the human essence of this individual. But there is something invisible there, although it should be there. It's uh, at the surface, at least. You expect to see it, see it there. But because I know that there were some kind of like close emotional interaction um, um, that I had with them. And I know that it is not there in these photographs because I was the photographer. So there is a visibility of their presence and also invisibility of that intimacy in them. And I was struggling with this kind of like duality in the photographs that I was capturing that why they are not so truthful, at least, to the experience that I had uh, firsthand as a photographer. So I started to become interested in this, these discussions about mediumship and what is the relationship between medium and its content and how it can be conveyed successfully and how we can be truthful uh, to the content of a medium uh, that is supposed to communicate uh, uh, an intimate message. So it was around that time that uh, I started to practice uh, to change the course of my practice, I became very interested in the discussions around uh, contemporary photography uh, and photography as a medium, visual medium of communication. So I had a big turn from photojournalism uh, to photography as an art practice. Uh, I started to read lots of texts, uh, lots of books, and I kind of changed my practice. I moved to the United States. I started to uh, um, study photography at San Francisco Art Institute more seriously. I stopped being photojournalist uh, in general. Uh, and I started to get familiar with some of these texts, including, for example, Camera Lucida by Roland Barthes. And uh, I found lots of variety of different answers to those questions that I had about this uh, relationship between uh, the signs that are supposed to be in a visual medium, but they are actually not there. And what is the relationship between their presence and absence of them in the in a photograph? So Roland Barthes was saying that uh, in that book, he was saying that ultimately, or at the limit, in order to see a photograph well, it is best to look away or close your eyes. So he is suggesting that there is some quality in each photograph that is not tactile, that is not visual or haptic. Uh, it's not presence at the surface of it. We cannot see those photograph, uh, th uh, those qualities if you just rely on your eye, if you just re rely on your visual perception. You need to look away for a moment in order to go beyond the surface of those photographs and see what is uh, hidden or embedded within the visual layer of photographs. It was, very, it was a very interesting concept to me. I could at least make uh, kind of like a loose uh, sense of kind of like this question that I had about the relationship between medium and image. 
Uh, he also uh, bring, uh, uh, brings out a, c- a quote from Franz Kafka when he said, we photograph things in order to drive them out of our minds, as my stories are a way of shutting uh, my eyes. Uh, apparently, Franz Kafka had the same idea about his stories. He was uh, inviting his readers to uh, don't rely on the actual lines of his story. Don't rely on the wordings and grammar and letters. Uh, he was inviting his uh, reader to just close their eyes and read in between the lines. He believed that the main point of his stories are not written through texts, but uh, they are in between uh, the texts, similar to the way in which we look at a photograph, according to Roland Barthes. Uh, so I was very interested in this, uh, uh, became very interested in this subject, and I thought that I have to do something about it. I need to create something about this uh, uh, kind of like semi-pseudo research that I was having. Uh, and I also got familiar with this kind of uh, duality of mediumship, as Roland Barthes actually defines. He defines that uh, any kind of medium... Uh, that you use for communication has two layers, connotative layer, layer and denotative layer. Denotative layer is the layer that you have ac- access to, like literally, it's tangible layer uh, of communication, like texts and words and grammars and um, the uh, colorful pigments on a print or visual shapes that you see at the surface of a photograph or a paint, uh, painting. And these are the denotative layer of it. But there is a hidden and connotative layer there that is not visible. And you can only feel that. Uh, and uh, that feeling uh, um, should be activated through different modes of communication. For example, um, if you don't know a certain language like Farsi, uh, when I start to speak Farsi to you, for example, I get my Farsi with you, I get my Farsi with you, I get my Farsi with you, I get So for that few seconds, uh, I intentionally blocked your access uh, to the denotative aspects of this communication. For a few seconds, I spoke to you in a language that perhaps, or I, I assume that you don't know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the communication is still active. You're still there. You're still uh, looking at me. You're, you're, you can still hear the tone of my voice. You can still see the movement of my hands, my body language. So the communication is still active. The only thing that is absent here is the denotative uh, aspect of my language. Uh, so when this denotative aspect of language becomes blocked, uh, then the only way to, key, uh, to remain active in this communication is to pay attention to the connotative aspects of it, pay attention to my physical appearance in front of you and the tone of my voice and, and such things. So I was thinking about a way to activate that connotative layers in the, in the medium of communication and trying to, I was trying to find different ways to do that. Until I came around this play, this is a play written by Matei Vizhniak. It has a very funny, uh, long title. Uh, it says the story of the panda burst told by a saxophonist who had a girlfriend in Frankfurt. So Matei Vizhniak is a Romanian-French playwright, and most of his plays are about uh, the glorious modern human, uh, which despite of being a conqueror of the world and... Um, uh, finding all of uh, those uh, um, uh, unknown knowledge that was always hidden to human uh, uh, humankind uh, by bringing that to the awareness during the modern era. Uh, despite of that, they are still having trouble in communication. They cannot communicate with each other effectively. So in most of his plays, you see characters that are uh, not able to effectively communicate with each other, including in this play. This is a play about two characters known as him and her. And uh, throughout this story, you get uh, introduced to him uh, when he wakes up one day in his bed, in his bedroom. <clears throat> and he noticed that someone is uh, lying down be- uh, beside him, known as her. So uh, both of them, they don't have name. And then he starts to freak out. He asks her, she first, she, uh, he wakes up uh, her and then he asks her, what? what is she doing there and who is she? And then she gets surprised because... Uh, he cannot remember her. So she tries to help him to retrieve that lost memory and remember, uh, makes him to remember her and uh, the experience that they had 
spit each other a night before, uh, but uh, there is no use in that because he cannot actually remember anything. So they make this arrangement for her to come back every night for seven days to his apartment and help her to retrieve that memory. So throughout the play, throughout those seven days, they try several forms of communication, but nothing works and he cannot remember anything until the last night, the last day, um, uh, w- when they try a new form of communication with each other and the story ends there. I made this small short video uh, about that last interaction. Let's uh, look at this first and then I will continue. And this is how the story ends. So this was kind of like an epiphany for me. I started to find clear answer to the questions that I had, especially regarding to the process of uh, practicing what I discovered, how I can make a medium uh, that actually activates the quantitative layer of it. Um, it clearly happened at the end of this play. So when they see that n- none of the conventional form of communication uh, works for them, uh, they start with dissecting the conventional form or dissecting the language. This is the term that I would like to use. So instead of using the whole word, they start to just like use one letter, the letter A. Ah. Uh, and they start they started to communicate through that one letter, and then to, uh, in the middle of uh, that attempt, they suddenly decided to actually even remove uh, uh, that dissected language. And the removal of that dissected language allowed them to reveal the connotative aspect of that communication, uh, which was just silence and just like looking at each other. So if you see the actual play, toward the end of the play for a few minutes, they were just like staring at each other without uttering any word, without any movement. They were just like looking at their, each other's eyes and that's how the story ends. It was fascinating to me that like uh, how they came up with this solution. I was wondering how I can actually create something like this. How can I create a dissected medium somehow with the hope of revealing its content? Uh, so. I started to do a little bit more research on this. Uh, I called this dissected medium the impotent medium because it is impotent of communication. It cannot communicate clearly. I mean, what is the meaning of the letter A? How you can communicate with A A is an impotent language, right? But at the end of the day, through this impotent medium, you're able to convey the message, the connotative message that uh, uh, I was looking for, right? So I started to work on this project as a test in 2011 when I was still in Iran, uh, in the city of Tehran. I created a a Facebook account um, without putting any real information about myself. And I started to invite random people, people that I don't know. I just found them randomly in Facebook. um, And uh, the only criteria that I was following was that they had to be in the same city that I live in, in the city of Tehran. So I sent about 500 messages to random people through Facebook. And uh, the content of this message was this, that I'm an artist working on an art project. Uh, I'm inviting you to meet me in any location that you want, a location of your choice in the city of Tehran. 
uh, and I'm intentionally not giving you any information about myself and what is this project about. Once we met, we are going to talk about the projects and I will share more information. And the second request that I had was to bring an object to the meeting. So if I asked them if you accept to, uh, if you accepted to meet me, uh, um, in a certain location, your uh, location of your choice at any, uh, during any time of the day, any day, uh, any time of the day uh, that you want. And uh, then you also need to bring me an object, a uh, souvenir, an object that, uh, that you, you should feel free to share actually that object with me. So it should be something that isn't, that doesn't have any personal uh, value to you. So, uh, uh, out of those 500 messages, I received uh, um, about 50 responses from people. Uh, and out of those 50 responses, I, were, uh, uh, I was able to meet um, about 25 people in different locations in the city of Tehran. And uh, they brought me objects to see some example of them. So throughout that conversation that we had with them, I had with them, I captured uh, a portrait of them and also an image of the objects that they shared with me. So you can see some examples of it here. So what is this object? This object is something that I was hoping uh, that I could kind of like render those objects somehow as the dissected object or the dissected medium. So this, the, the way that I was thinking about this project during the process of ideation was that I'm going to put these subjects in a situation uh, uh, that is not known to them. So they are being reached out by someone that they don't know. Uh, that person doesn't share any information about himself. Um, and they don't know what is going to happen in that meeting, why actually they should accept that meeting, first of all. And what is going to happen there? Who is that person? Is he uh, lying, actually? Or uh, should I trust that person or not? Uh, so there are lots of mixed uh, feelings about it, like the sense of curiosity, is one of them. Uh, the sense of uh, insecurity, of course, is uh, another one. Uh, and uh, lots of kind of like mixed feeling that I was hoping uh, that they could experience. And amidst, amidst of all of those feelings, they had to also choose an object. So I was hoping that that object that they choose could manifest that uncertainty somehow, that mixed feeling that they have inside of themselves. If I was giving them, uh, giving them enough information, then they they could actually choose that objects very deliberately based on those information and I couldn't achieve my goal. So I wanted to keep them on uh, that situation, on balanced situation. So the objects could be the manifestation of the feeling that they had. So this object somehow becomes uh, the, the conveyed message, the notative message of their feeling, uh, uh, the feeling of meeting someone that is unknown. And in many cases it worked, like in many of them, this object became the denotative object somehow. So in, for example, this one was a, a great example. She happened to be an artist. I didn't know that. And uh, she said that she told me that she responded to my message by saying that I, um, I'm really curious to know what is this project about, but I have uh, some sort of rule for my personal life. I don't meet people that I don't know, um, uh, like out of blue. So what I want to do is to actually meet you online. You never said like it needs to be a physical location. I can meet you online through video chat uh, and I will send you my object as a digital file. Uh, it was very interesting. It was a very inter interesting response. So I accepted that. So she met me through uh, um, an online video chat and she sent me one of an image of one of her artworks actually uh, as the object. Um, or this one was also a very interesting example. Uh, so she uh, gave me this exacto knife, and when I asked her why this knife, she said, um, I was so curious and afraid at the same time. I was feeling, in, uh, I was. Uh, I was afraid of my uh, my kind of like security there, meeting someone that I don't know in the middle of the city, a large city like Tehran. So I thought I'm going to uh, have this object as my souvenir. Uh, and also at the same time, if something happened, I can use it to secure myself. So it was very interesting to me that how many of these objects became kind of like the manifestation of the feeling that they had. Without these objects, I couldn't actually find access to that genuine feeling uh, that they had uh, during the time of 
receiving that message uh, because we as human beings we usually tend to block those negative feelings right so when if if there was not this, uh, this object during our meeting she could just like hide all of those uh, mixed feeling and try to be like appropriate in the discussions and show an appropriate version of herself right uh, but this object somehow actually revealed that for me uh, during that communication. So the image that you see on the left is basically the full journalistic representation of that person, something that I was doing for many years before. But the picture on the right is this new discovery, this artistic representation uh, uh, of that person that I was uh, looking for. This is another example, another project that I did uh, when I moved to Oregon at the University of Oregon to continue my research called Reidentification, which talks about the same concept. In this project, I confined myself uh, inside a pedestal. Uh, I made this pedestal um, and uh, I positioned my body inside of it. There was a hole uh, at the top of the pedestal and my head was popping out. Um, there was another pedestal beside uh, the, the main one and I had several shaving tools on them and the, the performance was happening in the public space. So people who were passing by could actually grab any of those shaving tools and shave my hair and facial hair in any way that they want. So the way that I was situating myself there and my head specifically there was completely uh, passive, which means that I wasn't uh, interacting with anyone. Uh, I wasn't looking at anyone, making, uh, I wasn't making any eye contact, uh, and I uh, didn't respond to any uh, uh, communication. So I was basically presenting my head as an object uh, on the pedestal so they could reform it in any way that they want, like in sculpture. It was a very interesting experience, uh, but this time for me, all of those uh, mixed feelings that I mentioned about my uh, subjects or participants in previous projects, now in this project, I experienced them myself. And the, the feeling, the, the, the sense of vulnerability, the sense of even joyfulness of having this sort of interaction with other people, the sense of wonder about, uh, regarding or about people's interaction and how they feel about this interaction was very interesting to me. But uh, my goal with this performance was actually exactly the same thing. I was hoping that I could dissect this physical appearance of myself somehow. Uh, in a very metaphoric and somehow literal way. Um, so I was always thinking about my body and my physical appearance, especially after I moved to the United States and uh, by experiencing this uh, cultural change, I was thinking about my physical appearance like this uh, large, giant dude with uh, black, dark facial hair and hair that is so different than people from the, uh, another culture is basically the denotative aspect of my identity. This is how my identity is being defined by others by looking at my physical appearances. So I was thinking that like, if it is possible to somehow dissect that and find a way into the connotative aspect of my identity, what the thing that I, re I, I really want to expose about myself that is beyond my physical appearance. So I decided to choose my hair and facial hair because in Iranian culture, the way that you trim your hair and facial hair is very important. First of all, it is very personal. And second, it uh, identifies your uh, political point of view, your religious stand, uh, your social level even, uh, the way that you trim uh, your hair and facial hair. So it's a very personal aspect of your identity. And just exposing that and allowing people to change that personal aspect of your identity um, uh, was a bold move for me personally uh, first. Uh, and I was hoping that it could uh, um, kind of like depict this um, dissection of uh, the surface of identity at some level for the people who were participating in the project. It was a very interesting experience. As you can see, some people, they had a very um, joyful uh, interaction. Some people, they were very polite and considerate. Um, some people, they were crying while doing this. Um, uh, I had a, a, a wide range of uh, different reactions to this project. At the end of two hours of this performance, I ended up without any hair and facial hair on my uh, face. Uh, so this is my thesis projects, uh, my graduation project uh, called Ah, and you know uh, what does that title, uh, what 
ti that title uh, refers to. It refers to the same play that I showed you. Um, so in this project, I uh, practice the same concept, the same thing. The project has two parts. Uh, one part includes uh, a wall piece, a large uh, digital print, uh, uh, and also this book. The book is uh, uh, the title of this book is "The Severed Head," written by Julia Kristeva, the feminist writer. Um, which was a very interesting book, especially to me that time when I was involved uh, uh, with uh, these ideas and these theories. This book helped me a lot to find my way through them, uh, talking about the relationship between head and body parts to identity, uh, the collective identity as, uh, in general. Uh, so I thought that I have to use this book somehow uh, in my project. So what I did, I uh, grabbed the book and I used masking tape and I covered all of the textual elements in the books, line by line, word by word, with that masking tape throughout the whole book, uh, except the word heads. So wherever I was seeing the word head, I was just like leaving that uh, uh, unmasked. So the only text, textual element that you can read throughout the whole book uh, is the word head. Um, um, there, uh, there were, I think, something around 60-something, uh, 60 65 uh, uh, words of head throughout the whole book. Uh, and uh, the other component was actually this wall piece that I'm showing you, which shows a self-portrait portrait of a body that is curled into itself, uh, like a fetus inside the womb. Uh, and... Uh, um, you don't see the head of the body because of the angle of uh, the photograph. Uh, the other thing that I applied to this digital uh, uh, image, digital print, was covering the surface of the whole print with the same red masking tape that I used for the book. But this time, after I covered the whole print, I started to remove the tapes uh, one by one. So those white marks that you see on the prints are actually the parts that remained uh, after the process of removal. Those are the areas that were peeled off from the print with the tape when I was removing them. So I somehow left some scars and destruction at the surface of print uh, by doing that. Uh, the only difference is that this time on the print, the body uh, was left exposed rather than the head, which I had in the book. Uh, the second part of this uh, per, uh, installation was uh, about 65 bricks, the same number as the number of head that was exposed in the book. Um, these are kiln bricks. They are very fragile. Uh, and uh, what I did was translating a complete book. Uh, against interpretation by Susan Sontag from English to Farsi. So I used these permanent markers that you see there. Um, it took a lot of them. Um, and I just wrote the whole book in Farsi, translated and wrote, uh, wrote it down by hand uh, uh, at the surface of all of these bricks. So this was the installation before the opening, and during the opening, audience were uh, allowed to actually enter into the space, uh, go through the book, and walk on the text, uh, the written text in Farsi. But the thing is that the, all, all of the visual materials that they were experiencing in the space were somehow destroyed, dissected and destructed, either initially or even by themselves. In terms of the bricks, when they were walking on, on those bricks, the bricks were starting to dismantle and fall apart because, as I said, they were very weak. So because of their interaction, they were basically destroying the, the bricks. And also in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the print and the book, they were also uh, already redacted uh, by the artist. So they couldn't actually have access to the main, um, kind of, uh, the, the main denotation of the text because the denotative aspects of the language was uh, redacted by the red masking tape. And also print was somehow destroyed. Uh, and also you don't have any information about the individual that you see on the print uh, because uh, his head is actually not exposed. Um, so this is what I ended up with at the end of the exhibition. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about this last project uh, called Intersecting Body that I did uh, uh, last year um, in Oregon. Uh, um, for this project, uh, I I did a collaboration with uh, six professional dancers. Uh, actually, it was a collaborative project. Uh, there was a sculptural piece that you can see here involved in this project. Uh, um, there are four plexiglasses attached to each other that creates kind of like a closed space. So I can find myself inside this glass box. 
Uh, and at the surface of glass box, what you can see is actually a written text uh, in Farsi again. So the text cannot be read by the audience, similar to the text on the brick. Um, the, uh, the targeted audience were, all, of course, American audience. So I was assuming that they don't know Farsi. So I was intentionally blocking their access to the text in both cases. In this case, the text tells a story of, it's a short story that I wrote many years ago about uh, a man who is trapped inside a small room. And after a while, uh, he starts to feel that he's becoming part of the walls that surrounds him. So his body was emerging into the walls and he documented that experience. Uh, so this is the story about written in Farsi, which means that people couldn't read, American audience, they couldn't read this story. So I, was, uh, I situated myself inside the box. And then we uh, performed this piece uh, six times in six different parts of the city of Eugene in Oregon. And each time uh, we performed this with one different dancer. Each dancer, they had a unique uh, uh, a choreographed movement in tandem with me inside the uh, box. The choreographer of the whole project was Shannon Mockley. She's an assistant associate professor of dance at the University of Oregon. And so each of these dancers, they're coming from different social class and also different, <clears throat> they have different political and social views and situation in their life. One of the dancers, uh, uh, he belong to LGBTQ, LGBTQ community and it was very active and uh, as part of his research in dance, his graduate research, uh, he was developing some movements that was related to uh, some aspects of his experience as a, as a member of LGBTQ movement. So the movement of his body was uh, kind of like related uh, to the social experience of being part of that community, which was very interesting, uh, the way that uh, uh, we practiced the movement in tandem with each other. So when the performance was, uh, at the beginning of the performance, the dancer was approaching uh, uh, to the box, and then we were starting to communicate with each other through the movement of body without any dialogue. <clears throat> And the dance had three movements. Each movement had its own story. And through these movements, we were trying to understand each other and explore each other uh, within the space um, uh, and find kind of like a dialogue through the position of the body and movement of the body. These are some examples. Another dancer, she uh, was uh, um, an immigrant, uh, Mexican immigrant. Uh, the other dancer, um, um, he used to be in army, but, uh, he decided to actually come out of the army and, uh, live, uh, the life of free soul. Like, uh, he's an amazing, he was an amazing individual. Um, so he completely changed his life, uh, and lived, uh, like freely, uh, free of all of those rules and boundaries of, uh, uh, an individual who serves uh, at the army. Uh, so each of these persons, they have their own story. And we wanted to actually communicate through that without having access to uh, the denotative aspects of our character. They didn't know about those texts. They didn't know about me. We, we, we were not able to actually talk to each other. Uh, of course, at a metaphoric level. And uh, the, only, the only way that we could have access to each other was through the movement of the body. Even at the, at the very, in a very literal way, uh, in this space, we were in a different location. Like I was confined inside a box. I couldn't come out of the box. Uh, it was like a prison for me. They were outside of the box. Uh, they were outside of that confinement. Uh, so we were in two, two completely two different spaces. I was kind of like wrapped by the element of my culture and traditions, which was manifested through the Farsi text. I was the pri uh, imprisoned uh, within uh, this traditional elements, but again, metaphorically, and they were outside of that. They didn't have access to it. They didn't have access to the inside of this culture. They couldn't speak my language, uh, but we were still able to communicate with each other in all of those six uh, dances, dances that, were, uh, that happened actually throughout those performances. And finally, this is uh, uh, the project uh, that is related to what you see in the exhibition uh, there. Um, this is a project called Looking Glass. We started to work on this project in 2018. Uh, it is part of a traveling exhibition called uh, uh, um, uh, Before We Were Banned. So the whole exhibition is a group exhibition exhibition. Uh, uh, consists of several artists and all of those artists, they are from, all of them are from those countries who were initially included the first uh, travel ban bill uh, in the United States. Um, artists from uh, Somalia, from Iran, from Syria, uh, from those six countries actually that were <clears throat> included in the travel ban. Uh, 
So my contribution to that uh, um, group show, a traveling show, was this project called Looking Glass. Uh, for this project, I interviewed uh, 12 Iranian individuals who are living in the United States, either students or immigrants or people who are working here. Uh, and they were people, those people whose life were affected by the travel ban um, on different levels. Uh, so I invited them uh, and I interviewed them about their experience and how travel ban actually affected their life, the difficulties that they had in, uh, uh, throughout these years. And I talked about their identity, that how they think their identity and the way in which they want to represent their identity is being affected uh, because of this political uh, feud between the United States and Iran. Uh, so the most common concerns among all of those discussions uh, coming from them was this idea that um, um, because of these political tensions, uh, the way in which we want to present ourselves in the society as an immigrant uh, is uh, being affected because of this uh, political issues. And we are not able to express our, ourselves freely in any way that we want. Uh, every aspect of our identity and individuality is affected by those pre-assumptions regarding uh, our nationality and where we are coming from. So I thought that I have to do something with this idea throughout this project. I asked them to uh, write me a list of words in Farsi again, uh, that represents their identity in any way that they want. I ask them to just uh, go beyond nationality. Don't think about their, uh, uh, I ask them to not think about their nationality, about their gender, uh, about their job and profession. Just think about their pure self. If they w have this chance to introduce themselves uh, to people around them uh, through a list of words, what are those words? And I ask them to write them down in Farsi. So um, they send me those words and I uh, used vinyl uh, and vinyl cutter to cut those words on vinyl, as you can see here. Um, uh, and I uh, in the exhibition, I covered the whole wall of the exhibition space, all of the walls in the exhibition space with, uh, with those words. Uh, you can see part of the installation here. And then there was a video channel of uh, their face um, uh, and their facial expression while uh, during the interview and while uh, talking and thinking about those issues that they experienced because of the travel ban. So I had a camera zoomed into their face and I was recording their facial expression actually throughout the interview. So the video was being played in the space and uh, the rest of the walls were covered with the text of their identity, actually. Uh, so when audience were entering into the space, they were somehow enwrapped by the identity of this individual, the identity that they don't have access to. They cannot read it because they don't know these individuals. They don't know about their culture. They cannot talk uh, or speak with them in the same language that they speak with. Uh, but at some at, at some level, they can connect with them when they look at their faces. Although it's an unknown territory, it's an unknown space filled with unknown language and unknown forms of identity. But by just like looking at their face and looking at their facial expression, uh, they can feel that they are close to them. They know them. They know how they feel. They know why they are sad. They know why they are angry. They know why they are um, happy or not happy. Um, and that's kind of like a universal way of understanding each, each other, uh, understanding each other and go beyond uh, the cultural barriers and cultural limitations. So that was the whole idea with this project. So what you see right now there uh, is the second phase of this project. It's an extension of this project that I'm uh, working on for, uh, um, for about a year. Um, I decided to add a second level uh, to this project by adding something that is more tangible for the audience regarding the identity of those individuals. I wanted the audience to be able to touch that identity, uh, that the, the things that is being covered by the denotative barrier of culture, uh, something that becomes so connotative to the point that you can actually hold it in your hand. How that abstract connotative uh, part of their identity could be manifested in that object. Uh, that was my question, if I could even do that uh, or not. So uh, I, uh, what I did was using a software, Face OSC, which is a very simple um, uh, application that allows you to actually read uh, um, uh, the facial expression, the movement of muscle in the face. This is a very basic software that they usually use for facial recognition softwares by making it more advanced. 
<clears throat> so when you feed the videos of faces uh, into the software, uh, the software tries to actually uh, uh, map the look, uh, specific location on the face, like for example, the cheekbones, the nose, uh, upper lips, lower lips, uh, eyelids. They, uh, the software maps the location of uh, these points and also the change of them in the space. Like when the wides are going to be uh, wider, uh, the, the change of the location in the space uh, will be mapped as digital data through this software. Then I wrote uh, uh, um, uh, with, pro with uh, processing, which is a language software, language coding program, um, Java-based program. I wrote uh, a program that was actually extracting this data from face OSC and translate them into a digital database uh, as numbers. So for each of these parts of the face, I had a, a different input. Uh, of digital data for the eye, left eye, right eye, nose, and uh, lips. And then uh, when I, once I gathered those data, I used a uh, software called Blender for 3D modeling. And I uh, arbitrarily mapped out those eight inputs that I gathered from their face of each of these individuals uh, uh, into the movement of a mass uh, 3D objects in the 3D space uh, through Blender. So, for example, uh, and I, it was arbitrarily, as I said, so if the mouth was uh, uh, becoming open, like wider than normal, then the, the mass in the space was moving toward y-axis faster. So it was being stretched toward y-axis faster. If the eye was being closed, for example, uh, I mapped it this way that the mass was uh, actually twisting uh, a long x-axis, like with a certain rate, uh, based on the openness or wideness of the eye. So I mapped any of those, uh, each of those outputs, uh, to something uh, or a force that would change the objects in the space. So I ended up with something like this. I'm going to show you uh, a video that shows what happens to that object when, and uh, in, 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 in a live view when the video is being played and how that data is being gathered. Um, um, through uh, processing. Um, let me show this to you in this video. So in this video, what you see on the left is uh, what happens to the object inside the blender. Um, and on the right, on the top right, you see the actual face uh, when uh, um, face OSC tracks the movement of uh, different parts of the face and on the bottom uh, uh, you see the, uh, the processing uh, program that I wrote which actually extracts those data inputs and uh, save them into uh, a digital database and you can see that how the objects in the blender is responding to the change uh, of muscles on the face right now when the uh, muscles start to move the object also gets deformed uh, responding to that move. So basically, uh, for each of those individual, I uh, ran their video input uh, um, into the same uh, through the same process, and for each of those individual, I had one unique uh, object of uh, their facial expression, uh, basically. And um, um, I'm going to show you. Hopefully, the objects are there, and you can actually see them. Uh, but here is. Um, an example of uh, at least one of them that I'm going to show you. Uh, then, uh, so those objects, uh, when I uh, created them uh, through um, Blender, I was uh, actually able to print them uh, with 3D printer. And this is one of them. So I used the 3D printer to actually print uh, all of those objects. Uh, um, so in the exhibition space there, you can see four of them and also the four uh, videos that are associated to each of these uh, objects, the four individuals whose facial expressions are being manifested through these objects. So this uh, was the project uh, that... Uh, I'm working on it still. It is still in progress, and you see actually part of it there. I want to thank you again for uh, um, sharing your time with me and uh, also giving me this opportunity to talk about my practice and my projects. It was my pleasure uh, to share this with you. Um, I wish you have a great time with the rest of the conference uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of the programs and events. Thank you.